This is all what we call the posterior cortex, the occipital lobe, which is really primarily just vision, parietal lobe, temporal lobe. These are in contrast to the frontal cortex. And the frontal cortex is anchored by the fact that its primary area is this M1 motor strip. This motor strip is where we drive our basic motor actions, and the areas on top of that, which we call the prefrontal cortex, in front of the frontal cortex, um, these additional higher level frontal areas, likewise have a higher level, more abstract relationship with these basic grounding kind of motor representations. So control, sequencing, those are really important aspects that allow us to kind of organize our motor behavior in a more systematic way. And if you're going to sequence and control, you need plans. And if you're going to have plans, you're going to have to make decisions. And if you're going to give a pig a party, you better bring balloons. So uh, if you're going to make decisions, you need to think about, well, what do I want? What are my motivations? And so it's also very interesting that the frontal cortex anchored inside here is a primary uh, area for the somatosensory signals associated with taste and smell. So those are two other modalities that we get that uh, come directly in the frontal cortex and are particularly important for shaping affective and motivational systems. And so frontal cortex is also defined in terms of its inputs. If you think about it, it really makes sense that you need to have these motivational systems, these affective systems directly influencing the highest levels of, of decision making because ultimately decision making is about what do you want and what are your motivations, what are your goals. And so these parts of the brain are really important for coordinating and organizing our behavior in ways that get us the things we want. So these are really playing a very important role in shaping and controlling the functions of the rest of the brain, these posterior cortical areas. Uh, to make sure that these posterior areas are working towards the same goals that have been established up here through these kind of motivational decision-making and planning kinds of operations. This all is lumped under the term executive function. And we know that frontal cortex is really important for this kind of executive control. For example, through lesions where people who have damage to the frontal cortex suffer uh, from an inability to plan to think about the future and to organize their behavior in a kind of strategic way. They often become impulsive. There's a term called environmental dependency syndrome where you just start uh, kind of reacting to the environment um, without thinking about the context or your goals or social norms and all these other things. And so a classic example was a patient who came to a, a doctor's house and just saw the bed there in their house and just went in the bedroom and laying down to go to sleep. So just like immediate kind of reflexive cues. And so the frontal cortex is what is, allows us to go beyond that kind of immediate reflexive form of behavior and behave again in these more rational, higher level ways. And yet these higher level ways are also anchored in these fundamental motivations, creating this interesting paradox that our highest levels of kind of rationality or control are also very strongly influenced by our motivational systems. That is the primary reason that we are so irrational, even as we struggle to try to be rational. We're so compelled by our basic motivational drives. And if you go back to the classic Freudian level psychology, you can kind of see this, that, that it's really capturing this fundamental anchoring of our overall higher level cognitive control systems in these really basic low level motivational and affective drives. So this is kind of the nature of the human experience. And if you think about it, you know, computationally, rationally, it probably has to be that way, even though it is kind of what makes us crazy. Uh, so very interesting ideas about, you know, how the organization of the brain does make sense in a, in a certain way, but also may be the source of a lot of problems that we also have to deal with. Another really important way we can gain access to understanding what the frontal cortex is doing is from the fact that when we go to sleep every night, 
the frontal cortex is the part of our brain that is most deactivated. So this area kind of goes offline to the greatest extent. And what's left is sort of a window into what it would be like if you didn't have a frontal cortex. So what are dreams like? Well, they tend to be disorganized. You can't really ever do anything very practical in your dreams. I'm often trying to catch an airplane and I can't remember the gate. I go to that gate and it's the wrong one. So this kind of lack of control, lack of sequencing. I run into a friend from high school, you know, that's probably not very reasonable. The kid looks like he was back in high school. I don't notice. And we start talking about stuff. Who knows what happens? All kinds of uh, associations well up. All this stuff kind of randomly intermixed. So no sense of proper sequencing or control. The, pa the behavior is very disorganized. The cognition is very disorganized in dreams. And that, again, reflects the absence of this kind of control from frontal cortex, organizing and shaping our behavior in ways that kind of are more teleological or ends driven. So yeah, so then in the absence of that, we get more of this kind of free association. You can imagine these kind of spreading waves of activity out here in parietal and parietal and temporal lobe, allowing our brains to kind of you know, just follow trains of thought one after the next without any constraint from this higher level cognition. And so there is a really interesting line of thinking that says, if you want to be creative, you need to somehow turn off that frontal control, the rigid taskmaster telling us always what to do. And so when you dream, you have an opportunity to be very creative, think of new ideas. And that all comes from not having to be kind of driven from this frontal area. So you can learn a lot about how your brain is organized just by thinking about these large scale pictures of these sources, these basic fundamental primary constraints on different areas, and then thinking about how they interact and shape our behavior. And those things give us a good foundation for understanding, as we will, each of the different topics that we go through in the rest of the chapter. So development also provides a very important window into to understanding how the brain is organized. Uh, one of the most important facts that we know about development is that it is primarily like a chisel. Uh, our brains are kind of like this big unformed block of marble. And then as our brains develop, this chisel of synaptic pruning carves away all the connections, synaptic connections that we don't need, leaving the ones that are actually effective. That may be in part determined by a Hebbian process also very much probably shaped by the air driven learning mechanisms and generally reflecting the overall strength of the synaptic connections. And what you see here is that at this very early developmental age, there's still a lot of synaptic pruning taking place, but posterior primary visual cortex right here, V1, has already undergone its synaptic pruning wave. And so it's relatively stabilized. And we can see up here that uh, primary uh, motor and somatosensory areas are also relatively stabilized. And so these waves that we've understood of how these kind of sensory and motor areas kind of radiate out to determine the overall function of these different brain areas is also evident here in these synaptic pruning waves. The early parts of those sources and sinks are pruned first and then the higher level in between areas get pruned last. So we can see here that frontal cortex experiences a more prolonged period of synaptic pruning. And this reflects the idea that you don't want to sort of stabilize or lock in those synapses yet uh, because these areas are still undergoing a lot of developmental changes. There's a lot of learning taking place and it would be premature to kind of lock in a particular pattern of synaptic connectivity until you've really figured out the right kind of overall organization of that part of the brain. And so the very last areas here are in frontal lobe and these kind of very high levels of infratemporal lobe. Um, those are the areas that stabilize or prune last, indicating that those are kind of where we are doing our learning as we get up into our teenage and more early adult time period. Of course, once you become an uh, older adult, your brain is fully pruned and you can't learn anything new, right? 
actually you can your synapses are still plastic but you but you have kind of cut away a lot of the original synapses that were there and that makes it harder to learn brand new associations and so you really do end up kind of getting your brain locked down a bit